All right, welcome to ENVS 555. In module one, we'll be looking at water pollution, different types of water pollution, different ways that they affect organisms and ecosystems. We'll examine some of the fundamental principles that, understand, that underlie our understanding of different water pollutants. Uh, one of the critical ones is that different types of pollutants affect water in different ways. Uh, for example, a cross-media pollutant is not even a water pollution initially, it's an air pollutant and then shifts and then gets deposited and ends up in water bodies. Uh, so we'll examine those, those sort of things because some of them have differing types of effects. Uh, we'll look at a couple of case studies, we'll look at toxicity testing and what we call risk assessment, and then I'm going to finish up with uh, an examination of the index of biotic integrity as a way of measuring biological communities and inferring water pollution and the role of citizen science within that. All right, uh, some of the fundamental principles, uh, the type of pollutant is really, really critical. Different pollutants, uh, nutrients for example, are going to stimulate the growth of algae and then that leads to overproductivity and ultimately can lead to a dip in oxygen level. Uh, other, organ other materials are just directly toxic to organisms, but might not be toxic at their concentration in the water, but as you get higher up the food chain, get more and more concentrated. Uh, the medium of the pollutant is uh, critical. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at water pollutants, but we'll also look at air pollutants that are what we call cross-media pollutants that can then end up in water bodies. Persistent and biodegradable are, are two critical distinctions. Uh, biodegradable can be toxic initially, but then it breaks down over time and doesn't have long-lasting effects, whereas some of the ones that are of greatest concern are uh, the things that will last for a long time period in the environment. Uh, DDT persisted many, many years. PCBs persisted many, many years. Even though they decline over time, they can still have long-lasting effects long after the pollutant is released into the environment. Uh, the difference between point source and non-point so source pollutants. Point source, you can basically narrow it down to a pipe or a ditch or a discharge, a specific source that all of the pollutant is coming from that thing, from a factory. Okay, Non-point source is kind of a little bit more diffuse. Uh, so you might have nitrates coming into a watershed from a farm, but which farm is it? Which part of the farm? Um, is it from the pigs? Is it from the corn? Is it from, you know, what, what part of, of this is it from? It's more diffuse within the uh, environment. And so point source pollutants are easier to target, easier to identify, and easier to mitigate. Non-point becomes a little bit harder. You need things like buffer strips that are going to kind of intercept nutrients as they're coming into a system uh, in order to remove those. Acute and chronic effects. Now, I, whenever I ask my classes this, which one is worse, acute versus chronic? Everybody always says chronic effects. Acute effects means it kills you quickly. So really, acute effects are, are critical to understand, you know, what, what is happening in the, in the short term. However, with that said, chronic effects can be important, especially if they influence an organism over time. They might change the organism's behavior, and it might engage in more risky behavior. Um, it might speed up its metabolism, something like that. Those would be chronic effects. They're, they're lower level, but they're harder to detect, they're harder to study. It's easier to look at how many of these fathead minnows got killed by this particular pesticide. Um, now, bioaccumulation and biomagnification are also fundamental concepts. We're going to explore those in detail in the next couple of slides. So bioaccumulation basically means it's the accumulation of pollutants in organisms over time. So the organism starts with no pollutant, and then over time the concentration in their body increases over time because they take up the materials and store them in their adipose tissues or their fatty tissues. And potentially because they continually store and store and store the materials, they can get more concentrated in the organism than they can in the environment. And so for the, the example in the picture here, uh, elm trees are sprayed at two to four parts per million of DDT, 
but the concentration in the, the topsoil earthworms and robins can greatly exceed that two to four parts per million just because they're accumulating it and storing it in their lipids. Biomagnification means a subsequent increase in the pollutant as you go higher up the food chain. So it relies on bioaccumulation and each organism basically depositing these fat soluble materials in their lipids or their fatty tissue. And then as you get higher and higher up the food chain, they're basically consuming organisms that have more and more of a pollutant within it. So in this particular uh, example, PCBs, which are polychlorinated biphenols in the Great Lakes, uh, the concentration of the water is minuscule. Phytoplankton will bioaccumulate it and their concentration will be higher than uh, the water. So, um, you know, 0.0025 parts per million. Zooplankton then eat the phytoplankton, which have a higher concentration than what is in the water, and then they store those materials in their lipids. So, uh, 0.123 parts per million. Rainbow smelt eat the zooplankton, and you have about a tenfold increase in the concentration of the PCBs. Lake trout eat the rainbow smelt and some zooplankton, so they're about five-fold increase in their concentration. And then herring gulls are eating a variety of different uh, organisms, rainbow smelt, lake trout, uh, scavenging on this and that, and their concentration in their tissues and their eggs can be 124 parts per million, so uh, le potentially lethal concentrations. So DDT is well known. DDT has basically been pretty much eradicated within the United States. There are still some places uh, in internationally where it can be sold and utilized by people that don't know the long-term um, environmental consequences. So originally, uh, all, all of these harmful pesticides and harmful toxicants were developed because they were thought to be uh, good good materials and this is going to solve our problem of too many mosquitoes or too many bugs so it was kind of thought to be what we call the magic bullet it only it only shoots the thing that you're interested in and it leaves everything else alone because the initial measurements the concentrations in other organisms within the environment are were really really low and so it was thought to do a great job of of killing uh, the pests and at the, at the base of the food chain, really, really low concentrations. But it gets biomagnified as you get higher up the food chain, and it has the specific effect of thinning the eggshells of predatory birds. So uh, our, our osprey here or other uh, organisms at the top of the food chain basically would have their, their reproduction cut down to low or zero uh, because their eggs were so thin and they'd sit on the egg and squish it, you know. So the bald eagle, uh, the osprey, the brown pelican were endangered as a result. When your national symbol goes on the endangered species list, you know that there's a problem. And so they banned DDT in the 1970s, at least in terms of purchasing within the United States. Uh, U.S. companies could still continue to make DDT and then sell it overseas. Uh, but it was banned and the concentrations have been decreasing over time. The amount of bald eagle, osprey, brown pelican have increased greatly as a result of banning DDT. All right, so different types of water pollution. We've dealt with kind of the fundamental principles so far, how toxicants affect. Uh, toxicants have uh, that, that effect that they kill organisms, but the other things that are listed on this slide are going to affect systems in different ways. So for example, organic waste like sewage. In addition to having disease-causing bacteria associated with sewage, uh, there's a lot of what we call biological oxygen demand, or BOD. And it's basically organic material that then gets decomposed. As it gets decomposed by bacteria, it uses up oxygen, and that decreases the concentration in the environment. So uh, there, you're, you're getting hit with E. coli, for the disease-causing waste, but the, the, one of the big effects is that it uses up the oxygen. Uh, plant nutrients can also be affiliated with, with sewage or they can come from farmers' fields and things like that. This is gonna stimulate the growth of algae 
and then the algae as they die and decompose can potentially use up oxygen. This process is called eutrophication and we'll get to it in detail on the next couple of slides. One of the most widespread pollutants is sediments and you see that in this aerial photo uh, from this, this textbook where one of the tributaries basically is fairly clean and clear uh, but it's running into a river that is transporting tons and tons of sediment and uh, sediments not as harmful by itself. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily kill the organisms, it doesn't necessarily stimulate the growth of algae, you can have nutrients attached to it, it can do things like smother the spawning grounds of trout and sensitive clear water species. It's not good to have sediment erosion, uh, you can, it can result in a loss of fertility from farmers fields. Um, it, you can have toxicants that then ad attach themselves to sediment particles, so that can be potentially a, a concern. And then radioactive substances. In some places there can be an accidental release of this and it can cause uh, effects. We're not going to deal with that so much. We're going to focus more on the ones that are bolded here. Uh, also heat, that's called thermal pollution. So adjacent to some power plants there can be a release of warm water uh, as a part of the cooling process. They'll take up cold river water or ocean water, run it through the pipes, it absorbs some of the heat from the power plant and then that, that's dumped into the environment. And so it might be um, three to five to 10 degrees Celsius different depending on how far you are from where the, the plume is. Again, this is not something we're gonna focus on. Uh, and then acid rain we are going to focus on. So that's a cross-media pollutant that's released as an air pollutant and then ends up in water and has a number of different effects there. So the point is that all of these different pollutants affect aquatic systems in different ways and you have to understand the ways that they affect the systems in order to understand uh, their effect on organisms. Uh, one of the well-known and well-understood uh, types of water pollution is eutrophication. So eutrophication is runoff of nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. This can lead to stimulation of algae growth and an algae bloom. Uh, the algae then basically take up the sunlight and shade out the, the plants that are underwater. So you might have underwater grasses that die off or what we call macrophytes, which are rooted aquatic plants. Uh, they can die off as a result of that. As the algae then die and are decomposed, bacteria break down the algae and then fish and other aquatic organisms can, can suffocate because they, they lack oxygen at that point. So this is a problem in lots and lots of different ecosystems. It's a widespread and pervasive problem. Uh, focusing on the Chesapeake Bay, it's one of the, the biggest things that uh, different environmental organizations are working to fight within that that system. Uh, I've mentioned acid precipitation. This is a cross-media pollutant. It comes from a variety of different sources. So uh, there's a whole bunch of individual smokestacks. So technically this is a point source pollutant. But when you add in transportation and cars and things like that, that's more non-point uh, emissions. Uh, so these emissions of hydrocarbons, nitrous oxides, and sulfur dioxide head up into the atmosphere, are chemically transformed into nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Uh, these particles then can undergo dry deposition or wet deposition and basically have an acid solution, somewhat acidic solution, end up in the aquatic, aquatic systems. And it can have a variety of different effects within those systems. So crustaceans and mollusks uh, are among the more sensitive species to acid precipitation. They can be affected by pH of 5.8 or something like that. Uh, and this is because they have a calcium, the, the snails and mollusks have a calcium carbonate shell and it makes it harder for them to grow their shell and um, basically the acid's dissolving it away. Um, other organisms are a little bit more tolerant, but not that much. Uh, whitefish, grayling, rainbow trout can deal with about, uh, say, 5.3 or so. Perch, pike, brown trout, eel, and brook trout, even more tolerant. Um, and insensitive insects are just knocked out uh, as a result of this. So they can be affected directly by the acidity. They can also be affected by aluminum toxicity, which we'll see on our next slide. 
Um, looking at the acidity of lakes in Scotland and the Adirondacks on the left-hand graphs, you can see as the, as you uh, increase the pH, so a more neutral pH is 7.0, you tend to have low concentrations of aluminum. As you get more and more acidic, you see logarithmic increases in the concentrations of aluminum, which can ultimately be toxic to aquatic organisms. So as a result, if you look in Ontario lakes, another area that is affected by acid precipitation, at a pH of about 6.5 or higher, you tend to have a high number of species on average, six to eight fish species within those uh, areas. As you then drop the pH down to five, down to four, the mean number of species of fish decreases dramatically just simply because the fish are not tolerant of these acidic conditions and the aluminum toxicity. Now, a couple of case studies. This is Clear Lake, uh, largest natural lake completely in California. Uh, it's located north of the Bay Area in, in California, near the coast, and they had a problem with uh, lots and lots of midge larvae in that area, and they would come in clouds at night, and it was bothering the people that live near there, so they released a chemical called DDD in order to try to kill them, and it had a bunch of unintended consequences. So 1949, 14,000 gallons of DDD to kill the phantom midge, uh, but four years later they were a nuisance again. They treated it and there was pesticide resistance that then developed in the organisms because the only ones that survived were the ones that were resistant to that level of DDD. Uh, this is a chemical that's not DDT, but it's in the same class of chemicals in the same chemical shape. Uh, then at this point they started to see dead grebes. This is the western grebe and um, it's, it's a, a bird that lives out in that area, has a wonderful mating dance and they found you know, 175 or so uh, and within four years of noticing that the grebes were dying there were only 15 nesting pairs left on the entire lake so they had almost wiped out the, the western grebe from Clear Lake. Uh, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring in 1962, alerted the world to the importance of toxicity pollution and biomagnification, and then steps were taken to kind of reverse this trend. One environmental case study close to the Virginia Wesleyan campus is the Keepone spill in the James River near Hopewell. Uh, Keepone is a non-biodegradable insecticide that was produced by the Allied Chemical Corporation and it led to a bunch of different spills and ultimately authorities had to shut down the chemical plant uh, that produced Keepone. Uh, naturally this builds up in the food chain and had a variety of different impacts. In the Elizabeth River, this is our home river for the Virginia Wesleyan campus. We're in the, east, the watershed of the eastern branch of the Elizabeth River. Uh, along the eastern and southern branch, there are places where uh, mummachogs have been affected by uh, benzoapyrene, uh, creosote in pollutants, and uh, the, the general class of chemicals is called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So as you see from the, the diagram, there's several benzene rings. And um, it, so it was derived from creosote pollution at the Atlantic Woods site, and it would build up in the environment. Uh, the mummachogs are actually really, really tolerant of this and actually have a number of kind of biochemical mechanisms that they can tolerate it and survive this particular pollutant. Um, but one-third of them developed liver cancers and 90% of the mummachogs in that area had precancerous lesions. So they were basically devoting a lot of energy to dealing with this high-level pollutant. They could survive there, but they, they, they were not doing well. And they were able to, uh, ironically, this made them more susceptible to other toxicants. So scientists did a study then where they looked at the ones that had dealt with this particular type of pollutant they then exposed uh, the minnows from non, the mummachogs from non-polluted sites 
to a different type of pollutant and the mummichogs from the Elizabeth River to that same pollutant and they actually found that they were more susceptible to the toxicant uh, just because they had focused so much on this biochemical pathway of being able to neutralize the polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbons. Now, over time, the concentration of materials, toxic materials in the environment can decrease, uh, but it's kind of a slow decline over time. So you can see uh, changes in the PCB uh, concentrations of lake trout and rainbow trout over time. Immediately after removing it from the environment, the concentration goes down, but it still stays at kind of a low level and persists for a long period of time. So this is one that can have kind of persistent, long-lasting effects. The way that we study toxicity in organisms is through toxicity testing. Usually it's a simplified system, it's a laboratory study. So you take fathead minnows or daphnia, uh, which is a water flea or something like that, and you expose them to a different dose and you vary the dose. And uh, initially at low dose, uh, they can survive it. They, they don't. They don't like it, but you know they, they can deal with low levels of toxicants. But as you increase the concentration, the sensitive organisms die. Then you might have half the population die. Then you might have most of the population die. And then at some dose, all of the population will die. The way that we compare this among different chemicals is what we call the LD50 or LC50. So LD50 is a lethal dose for 50% of the population. This would be like injecting lab rats with the, the chemical. What's the dose that then kills them? For aquatic organisms, we deal more with LC50s, which is a lethal concentration for 50% of the population. So in this case, seven hypothetical units would kill half of the organisms within the population. There's also a concept called the LT50, which is the lethal time for 50% of the population to die. So if you were looking at this and you were comparing two different chemicals and you knew that a dose of seven units would kill them, then, but how long would it take? Was it a quick, acute effect, or was it more of a long-lasting where chronically the, the population is doomed? and it takes a longer period of time for 50% of the population to die. All of these are different measures of how different chemicals are toxic. Now, we then take the results from these toxicity tests and then use that in what's called risk assessment. We want to take the lab results to predict what's the mortality in the field. We can't test every organism, so we might use one species as a surrogate for another. We might use a fathead minnow or a mummichog as a surrogate for another organism. And this lets us develop what we call QSARs, Quantitative Structure Activity relation, Relations. So, for example, in the, the graph here, as you increase the equivalent of dioxin, so it's not dioxin itself, but it's like this is the dose that's equivalent to that, you see an increase in egg mortality. It would be like with, with chili peppers, okay? If you take a jalapeno and that's a one, and then you take a spicier pepper, oh, this is eight times as spicy as a jalapeno, or this is a thousand times as spicy as a jalapeno for something like a scorpion pepper, okay? That's what a QSAR is in terms of risk assessment. So you might test sensitive life stages, like it might be just the larva of a fathead minnow, not the adults. Um, and then that way, if the sensitive part is knocked off, it gives you, builds in kind of a buffer factor. Uh, this is a, a salmon fry, coho salmon fry, but those might be what you test instead. And then that can let you infer what's toxicity gonna be like in the natural environment. And then you develop these relationships between different types of chemicals. Now, the KOW on the x-axis is what we call the octanol water coefficient. So basically it's does it dissolve in lipids or does it dissolve in water? If something dissolves in octanol, it's gonna dissolve in lipids uh, versus if it dissolves in water, it's not gonna dissolve in lipids. And this is gonna make it more likely to bioconcentrate because organisms take the material up store it in their lipids, 
and then that uh, leads to biomagnification and bigger environmental effects because you get tenfold increases with each trophic level or fivefold increases with each trophic level. So with a high octanol water coefficient, you see a high bioconcentration factor in the environment. So in addition to having certain chemicals be better able to biomagnify with a higher octanol water coefficient, uh, you end up having more of a biomagnification effect. The effect also depends on the food web configuration of the system for any one given chemical. This example shows uh, systems where lake trout functionally behave on three different trophic levels. They could be on the third trophic level consuming zooplankton directly, the fourth trophic level consuming forage fish that then fed on zooplankton, or in a long food chain, you might have the introduction of mice and shrimp. In this food chain, the lake trout feed on forage fish, which fed on the mice and shrimps, which then fed on zooplankton. So lake trout potentially could be carnivores, secondary carnivores, or tertiary carnivores in these systems. And clearly, because of biomagnification, the higher that they are up the food chain, the more of an effect there's going to be in terms of biomagnification. The graph on the right shows uh, the actual trophic position uh, for these. So when it's, inner, when it's the level four, that's such as you see on the middle of the graph on the left. 3.75 is mostly like level four, but a bit where lake trout feed on zooplankton directly. 4.5 would be a mix of feeding on forage fish that fed on mysis and feeding on forage fish that fed on zooplankton. So, and the way that we quantify this is by something called stable isotope analysis. The higher that an organism is on the food chain, the more their body is enriched in nitrogen 15. So scientists can use this to then determine the actual trophic level of the organism. In lakes with longer food chains, as you can see on the graph on the right, the PCB concentration gets biomagnified and uh, they've had to exhibit, uh, they've had to institute fish consumption advisories, especially in those systems with long food chains. The lake trout would be safe to eat in systems with shorter food chains, but we really have to be concerned and be careful uh, about the ones with a longer food chain because of the potential for biomagnification. Now, uh, the last thing that I want to really look at is measures of physical, chemical, and biotic measures of stream health. Now, physical measures are things like measuring flow rate, temperature, etc. cetera. Uh, you want a system that is going to be, for a stream, for example, that's gonna be well shaded up in the headwaters, that's not gonna be subject to uh, remarkable, uh, dramatic fluctuations in temperature. Chemical can be measured by measuring certain chemical compounds within the system, such as the, the biological oxygen demand or oxygen concentration or nutrient concentrations within the, the system. And you can infer something about the health of the stream. But those measures are just a snapshot in time. They, remar they, they basically report what was the stream doing at the time that the sample was taken. Biotic measures of stream health kind of measure long-term persistence because only sensitive organisms are gonna be able to survive in clean systems that are not adversely affected by pollutants. In contrast, ones that are affected by pollutants, in this case, organic uh, sewage sludge being dumped into a stream, uh, they're gonna show uh, more tolerant organisms within the system and in some cases you may have a, a stretch of the stream that's completely fishless such as you see in the septic zone here. So measuring from the clean zone upstream of the chemical spill downstream um, you, you initially have high oxygen levels and low biological oxygen demand. What biological oxygen demand or BOD is is how much oxygen would be used up to decompose the material that's there. Once you have the sewage uh, sludge, you still keep a high oxygen level, but the biological oxygen demand, the red curve in this diagram, jumps up uh, because there's a lot of material to break down. This then, as you move further downstream, lowers the oxygen concentration and places stress on the fish so that the only ones that can survive are things like carp, 
gar uh, that, that are tolerant of lower oxygen conditions. And ultimately you get to the point where it goes completely anoxic, fish are absent. And the invertebrate community goes from sensitive organisms upstream to tolerant organisms like leeches and then super tolerant ones like sludge worms, uh, bacteria, rat-tailed maggots, etc. in the septic zone. Then once you get far enough downstream, the system will have a chance to recover. The oxygen will diffuse in at the surface uh, and the biological oxygen demand will drop enough so that the system can start to recover. And then you have the tolerant organisms, the trash fish, quote, uh, within that system. And then far enough downstream, normal clean water organisms like trout, perch, bass, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies can persist within the clean water zone because they require clean water and high oxygen levels in order to survive. So this is a biotic measure of stream health, but that biotic measure basically is integrating the chemical and physical measures over long time periods, the time period of the organism's lifespan. Because if anything adverse happened during its lifespan, it would not survive. So this approach has been brought together by Jim Carr uh, in a biotic approach to ecosystem monitoring called the Index of Biotic Integrity. It's a measure that basically looks at how diverse is the system and how, how many sensitive organisms are uh, within the system. Because organisms integrate the ecosystem stressors over their lifetime, stress systems should have lower biodiversity and fewer sensitive organisms. They'd have more tolerant organisms or maybe no, no fish at all. And specific organisms are indicative of particular stressors. Okay, so if uh, the fish that you sample have tumors on them, then that's a toxicant, uh, cancer-causing uh, organism. Uh, green sunfish indicate a particular type of or organic stress. Uh, others are going to be more prominent if there's nutrient enrichment. And uh, both measures for fish and benthic macroinvertebrates have been developed. So benthic macroinvertebrate, uh, benthic means on the bottom, macro means large, and these are invertebrates. So larval forms of insects that are large enough to be seen with, uh, by the naked eye or with a hand lens. So as you move from upstream to downstream, you can see how the uh, fish community changes. You can also see how the invertebrate community changes. You have mayflies and stoneflies up in the key, the clean zone, then it transitions to leeches, then to the sludge worms, the rat-tailed maggots, then back to the leeches, and then to mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. So the, the organisms present within the system can indicate how polluted is that particular system. So this is the stream invertebrate community index, and uh, it gives some examples of some of the sensitive species, the alderfly larva, dobson fly, stone flies, water snipe flies, moderately tolerant amphipods, midge, black flies, um, moderately sensitive, so the crane flies, dragon flies, stone fly, uh, mayflies, damsel flies, crayfish, uh, the riffle beetle, which is a water penny, uh, caddis flies, fingernail clams, freshwater mussels. Those, if there's a little bit of pollution, they could be uh, affect. The sensitive ones would definitely be affected. The moderately sensitive ones with a little bit more. The moderately tolerant, they can deal with a range of conditions, but they're not super, super tolerant. And then the ones listed on the bottom left, the leeches, the tube effects worms, thread worms, uh, red midge larvae, those are the ones that are the most tolerant of adverse conditions. And if you get a system that's stressed enough, it won't even have those things. So this stream macroinvertebrate sampling and this index of biotic integrity actually can be easily sampled by citizen science volunteers. And so uh, elementary school classes, high school classes, college classes, uh, local citizen volunteers have been enlisted both to take water samples as some of the videos indicated but also to collect the macroinvertebrates as the macroinvertebrate uh, video indicated and this can be done well by both professionals and by citizen science volunteers and the, the advantage of having citizen science volunteers is that they are spread out in more places in the watershed and there's more of them 
so they can sample more systems and they can input their data into a collective database, uh, such as the Florida Lake Web, which we'll look at with our uh, activity. And if there is a problem in that area, then professional scientists can then be deployed to do follow-up samplings and verify uh, is this actually the case? Are the waters impaired or did they just miss these invertebrates that were there? So this is a really powerful tool and it kind of expands the reach of scientists and it helps to engage stakeholders like the water, mo uh, water monitoring volunteers. If they are passionate enough about water quality in their area to get up before 6 o'clock in the morning to go sample the stream by 6 a.m., in some of these cases when they want to have standardized water collection, then they're going to be engaged with the health of the stream and they're going to advocate for sound environmental practices that protect the health and integrity of their, their aquatic communities. Now, the macroinvertebrates are usually sampled midday by volunteers. It's, it's still valuable. It doesn't have to be the 6 a.m. time slot, but for some reason a lot of the water monitoring groups like to sample at 6 a.m. Uh, but this basically expands the reach of uh, our volunteers and it provides valuable information for scientists.